Welcome back to Meet and Greet, my friends. We have a special episode in store for you today. I am talking all things fire management. I've been barbecuing for over a decade. I've learned, I've learned behind the shovel, blood, sweat, tears, I've learned how to operate fires at what I would argue is an elite level. And, uh, and so today I wanna teach you everything I know about fire management. If this is your first time running a fire, if you bought a brisket or you bought a, a, a rack of ribs and tonight or tomorrow is your big day, you're gonna wanna watch this video. And if you've been barbecuing your entire life, trust me, I promise you, you'll pick up a tip or two, crack a cold one, I got a log boat, best beer in the Midwest. I'm gonna drink a log boat, enjoy a cigar, welcome you guys into my barbecue shack and let's do this thing together. First action item, building the fire. There's a lot of different ways to start fires and to build fires, but I promise you guys, how you start anything is how you finish. How you start your fire, in my opinion, in my experience, dictates how you feel. Even if you start the world's worst fire, but you recover and the cook goes perfectly, if you're anything like me, you just feel a little bit off. So you really wanna make sure that as you start this thing, you give yourself ample time. I like to start my fires an hour ahead that gives me enough time to build a good coal base. Don't worry, I'll talk about a coal base in a little bit, but it gives you time to build enough coal base to build that heat slowly, steadily, and it sets you up for success. No guesswork here. I'm gonna show you a fail-proof way to set up a fire. And, and wait, wait, very important. For my guys again, for my guys that are saying, Marcus, I do not have a 500 gallon smoker. Don't worry, my friends. I'm gonna show you my backyard smoker. I'll show you how we start fires. Dude, I'm bringing you the best freaking content on YouTube, in my humble opinion. Let's roll. When it comes to starting a fire, um, my preferred method is to build what's called the, I've heard it called the log cabin style fire or the Lincoln log style fire. The idea behind this fire is you're gonna build it in a way that creates enough airflow. Let me find the right pieces here, my friends. You're gonna build the fire in a way that creates enough airflow and enough space between each individual log with enough raise, enough rise off of the floor. So imagine this is the ground or the floor of my firebox. I wanna give enough space vertically and horizontally to allow my smoker to breathe. So my methodology behind building a log cabin style fire is I start with two splits on the bottom. Two splits, I space them anywhere between three to five inches apart. Anything too wide, and you don't have enough friction between the logs to create the heat that you need. Anything too close, and you choke the fire off on the front end. So I go about four-ish inches apart, make sure they're even front to back, and then what you wanna do is select your second layer of logs, and you want these to be really, really light. Look at this log compared to this log. It's really thin, really light, not dense at all. So what I do is I'll do three this way, about the same size. Two base logs. I'll throw my three easy light logs across here. And you want those to be about an inch and a half apart. If you see an aerial shot on top, there's about an inch in between each log. And so what we'll do is we're gonna follow up that support level or that support base with some heavier logs. In an hour's time, we're gonna have a big coal bed. That coal bed is gonna sit underneath the second layer of logs. And so the first layer is gonna give us our lift. The second layer on the initial start is gonna give us the BTUs or the heat required to build the friction and build the velocity that is the fire. The spacing is gonna give us our airflow, otherwise known as oxygen, which feeds the fire. The third layer is going to give us our weight. What do I mean by weight? Let me show you. This log here is very, very dense. I have held I would argue, I don't know, thousands of logs at this point. That sounds weird. <laughs> I've held thousands of logs at this point, And I can tell you just from feeling this, this is probably uh, in the low to mid 20s 
20% on moisture level. And so when I say dense, what I mean is you can physically feel the moisture content inside of this log. It's heavy. If you knock on it, it sounds really dense. And so this log is ideal for giving us vertical weight. We're going to use gravity to our advantage. So as I place this log on top, the second layer of logs, because they're thin and they're light, they're light both in weight and they're light both in moisture content. This is probably 12% moisture content at the max. And so these are going to burn faster. As these burn, they're going to turn into coals. This guy's going to drop down just due to the nature of gravity, force, and these light logs burning at a faster rate than this top log. Once this drops, the way I'm going to build it is I'm going to put this second log here. And I'm going to space these a, just, just shy of an inch apart. I'm going to go slightly closer than the secondary layer. And the reason I do that is because I want these two logs to talk to each other. I want there to be friction and I want there to be a conversation between the two logs. We got them close. They're meeting each other. They might get married. I don't know. I don't know. They might get married. I mean, they're really going to fall in love. So I want them just a little closer. Again, guys, if you're new to building fires, please keep this in mind. When you're building your fire, it's better to err on the side of wider than it is on the side of closer. For my veteran pit masters out there, you know exactly what I'm talking about. We've all been there where we built a fire and it's just a little too tight. And so it starts to choke itself out and you walk away thinking, okay, set it, forget it. I'll let it burn for an hour and I'll come back and put my meat on. Well, when you come back, it's just smoldering. The reason it does that is because you've choked out the fire. So my point is take the two dense logs, put them just shy, just shy of an inch. If it's your first time building a fire, I'd advise you to put them two inches, set them two inches apart. It's better to go here. So we'll leave it there. Now that's our third layer. That's the weight. The last layer we're going to do, and, and in my opinion, this is the most important layer. We're going to take medium sized logs, medium sized logs, meaning the second layer is really thin. The third layer is really dense. I'm going to take a log that's right in the middle of those two. You can see right in the middle. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to put this log right on top, right on top, right in the middle. The reason I do that is because, and you'll see this in a little bit once I light it. The reason I put the medium log on top is once this fire gets going, it needs a beacon point. It needs some BTUs to catch vertically. Something inside of this fire needs to tell it, don't go out the entire time, go out and up. This is going to give us a vertical fire. And the way we achieve a vertical fire, again, not in the cook, on the light, on the start, on the front end. The reason why we want a vertical fire is because vertical fires tell us there's ample oxygen. Ample oxygen means we're burning efficiently. Burning efficiently means we're going to establish a beautiful coal bed. So those are the main points when starting a fire. Again, I hope who I have on this video are guys who need this content. Like you are literally plugged into the video right now, like feed me, give me more. I hope you love this. Or I have my veterans who have been barbecuing for 20 years and you're just here alongside a fellow pit master cheering me on saying, dude, preach the good word. And I'm preaching the good word. So let me take this fire. Let me build it inside of there. Don't worry. Don't worry. I'll bring you along. And then I'll show you my preferred way of physically lighting it. I'll show you my preferred way of adding the fire to the actual fire. Let's do it. And that, my friends, is the most ideal fire starter. Now, before I put this in there, let me add a few notes. One, if you wanted to pour a bunch of gasoline on your wood, you can do that. I am a purist in the sense that I like to be able to tell people I have never, ever introduced anything other than pure oak wood and paper and just natural fat into my smoker. It really doesn't make that big of a difference. If you want to douse your entire uh, log cabin in gasoline and light it on fire, you can do that. 
Uh, it's it, it's so early on in the cook, there's no meat on there, it really won't make much of a difference. I just like to be able to say I've never done that. So again, if you wanna put gasoline, you wanna put instant light bag of charcoal in there, inside of your log cabin, you can do that. It's a bunch of different ways to skin the cat. I'm gonna stick this puppy in there, I'm gonna light it on fire, and we'll watch her burn. And then I'll show you how I start my backyard smoker. Stay tuned, I'm bringing you guys some good content. Like, comment, subscribe. Your engagement tells me if I should do these videos. If, 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 you don't, if you don't want me to do these videos, then, then let me know and I'll stop. But I hope you guys enjoy this. It's a beautiful thing, my friends. Fire's crackling in the background and our log cabin is on fire. So a couple things to note. Remember I was telling you about that, that northern star, that little tiny piece on top? If you can see, our fire is, is touching the bottom of that, and it's, it's telling our fire to burn vertically. If we didn't really have it there, it wouldn't be that big of a deal, but we'd have just a little bit wilder of a fire on the onset. Again, my smokestack is open, completely open. We wanna draw as much oxygen, as much heat, as humanly possible. We're gonna let this burn for an hour, we'll check back. I promise I didn't forget about you, my backyard warriors. So, what I have here is my Oklahoma Joe. I'm going to take literally 30 seconds to explain to you, in my opinion, the perfect way to start a smoker of this size. You can do it all kinds of ways. However, I think it's best if you take regular charcoal or lump charcoal. Gosh darn, I didn't have lump charcoal for this video, so I'm using regular charcoal. Just envision this was lump charcoal, and it's pretty simple. All you do is take one chimney. I have been cooking on these for years. I can tell you this. One chimney full of lump charcoal and a little tiny log will get you at least 250 degrees, if not over. That fire alone will run you about an hour's worth of, of a cook. So in theory, all you have to do is fill this guy up with lump charcoal, get it lit, dump it in the firebox. It's very, very, very important. Listen to me, guys. This is not a 500 gallon smoker, obviously. It does not work the same. If you go on YouTube and you see some guy telling you how to run a really big smoker, that's all good and dandy. However, that only works for a 500. This is completely different. You're gonna wanna leave your firebox door all the way open. You're gonna wanna leave your smokestack all the way open. I literally took off the plate on top of the smokestack because I don't believe in this. A smoker this size, you want extreme amounts of oxygen. You wanna burn an incredibly efficient fire. This, this type of smoker, especially one of these $200 Oklahoma Joes, uh, one of these big box store smokers, this is not the kind of smoker, I'm sorry, it's just the reality. This is not the kind of smoker to mess around with the dampers and try to run a dirty fire for two hours and then a semi-dirty and then a clean, it's not that. Just light the fire, run a clean fire for 12 hours, cook your brisket. I'll show you how I do it and we'll check back in a little bit once it's burning. It's smoky, folks. I got my chimney full of charcoal. The play from here is very simple. A couple things to note. What I'm gonna do is dump this charcoal inside of the firebox. I have my firebox door closed. If you leave this open and you dump the charcoal in there, it's gonna fall out. I know that sounds like a no-brainer. However, I've done that probably a hundred times. So close that down. And the second thing to note is my smokestack is wide open. Again, these kind of smokers, unless you got a backyard mill scale, a workhorse from Primitive Pits, a Syntex, some, or a Moberg, some really high functioning backyard smoker, this type of smoker, which most of us have in our backyard, is not the kind of smoker to play around with the dampers. Keep everything open when you're running it. With that said, this is the ideal size log to be using. For reference, this is a log that I would use in my 500. I'd even go bigger than this. This is the size log I would use in my backyard. What I'm gonna do is dump this chimney inside of the firebox. It's gonna give us instant heat. This gauge is gonna jump. It's gonna jump instantly. Keep in mind, my friends, um, 
this might jump to 400 degrees. Your gauge might actually read 450 degrees. Do not fear. It's okay. This gauge is a small contact point. The heat's going to touch it quick. It's going to jump. Keep in mind this entire cook chamber has to heat up. So what we're going to do is we're going to dump this in here. I'll drop that log on top and then I'll show you guys the right way to position the coals in relation to the wood chunk to get the best, most efficient fire. That is a screaming hot fire. Again, if you didn't catch this in the beginning, ideally these would be lump charcoal, but it's okay. We got briquette, we'll roll with it, but these are screaming hot. Because this unit is so small, that one chimney will at least give us 220 degrees worth of heat. That's enough heat to cook most barbecue. I don't like to cook on a backyard smoker like this unless I'm at least 250. I like to roll 275 the whole way through. I don't like to do anything fancy on this one. On the 500, I'll teach you guys in subsequent videos exactly how to manage fires for a cook. However, this application, just know my goal is to get this smoker up to 275, maybe 300. I'll put my meat on and I'll let it come down and it'll settle right at 250, 275. Once I got my charcoal inside my firebox, I'm going to do two things and then I'm leaving it and I'm ready to cook. The first thing is I'm going to get my ideal log. This guy's probably six to eight inches long, not too thick. I'm going to set that guy right on top. Once I set that on top, I'm going to open my firebox door up. And if you give it enough time, that log is going to catch. Once it catches, I'm going to let that puppy roll for about 20 or 30 minutes. I don't want it to fully combust, but I definitely want it to be fully lit and flaming. At that point, I know I'm burning a really clean, there's, there it lit, just right there. The wood's beautifully seasoned. If you have kiln dry wood, it's probably going to happen even quicker. Once that's lit, I know I'm ready to roll. I'm going to let that burn for probably five minutes with this top door open. Once I know it's, it's fully combusting, I'm going to close this down. I'm going to leave the firebox door open. I'm going to watch this gauge. And all I'm doing is I'm waiting until that gauge is 300 degrees. If that log skips my temperatures up to 500 degrees, it's okay. Just wait. It'll slowly climb its way back down. If it doesn't quite jump to 400, 500 degrees. We know for a fact it's going to jump to 250 and you're ready to roll. Put your meat on, start cooking. That is how I start a fire on my back backyard. It's very quick. It's very easy. It's very painless. I use a chimney. I fill it with charcoal. I dump the charcoal once it's lit. I get, I get a nice split, drop it right on top, let it combust, and we're cooking with grease. Fire has been burning for a good 10 or 15 minutes. As you can see, it's working flawlessly. We got good oxygen. We got good organic uh, pull from the smokestack. The fire is self-functioning. It's self-operating. It's burning itself. At this stage in the process right here, this is about a 200 to 225 degree fire. At this stage in the process, I know that in an hour's time, it is imperative that I have a good coal bed. If I don't have a coal bed, I am not cooking properly. So in order to plan for the next 45 minutes, again, in 45 minutes, we need a coal bed. I'm going to add more wood now that my fire has started. I like this really, really flaky, barky wood when I'm doing this. Again, this is a fairly dense piece of wood. It's really flaky, and this is just going to light almost instantly. I'm going to throw two more logs on the fire and that should get me to at least 275 and that'll build a perfect coal bed and I'll check back with you guys and I'll show you what you do once you got a coal bed. All I'm doing here is taking my shovel and I'm giving it some air. You definitely don't want the logs too close and you can see once I open that up it's just rip roaring. That's a fire, folks. We'll let that burn just like that for another 45 minutes, and I'll show you what a proper coal bed looks like. Also, before we exit, if you look, come in real tight down there, you can see that that second layer is starting to give way. You see how these two logs are starting to touch each other? Remember when I started that fire, 
these were literally two inches apart, but because that second layer is starting to give way on itself vertically, these logs are touching, and what's gonna happen is that fire is gonna fall right down on top of itself. It's gonna make for a perfect coal bed. As the fires are going, let's take a moment and just talk about wood. It's important to me that I don't become an echo chamber of other barbecue enthusiasts on YouTube making videos teaching you how uh, to build and operate fires. In an effort to not sound like an echo chamber, um, I'm gonna talk about wood, but I'm going to just briefly talk about wood. We all understand that there's different species of woods, okay, first. We all understand that the best wood for barbecue are hardwoods. Hardwoods are predominantly woods that produce fruits or nuts, uh, acorns, pecans, peaches, apples, etc. And so we can just take that, knock it out of the way. What I really want to talk about, um, and something that I wish uh, someone talked more about when I was coming up in barbecue, was the wood's relationship with the food. We all understand that we're doing offset barbecue, which means the flavor is gonna come from the wood, we get that. But what does that really mean and how do we actually use that, that data point while we're cooking? Without getting scientific, when wood breaks down, it produces heat. That's BTU. There's potential energy inside of wood. And so the way that we uh, ignite, no pun intended, the potential energy is with adding heat. Once the heat gets going, the wood starts to burn and there is a peak and there's a valley when it comes to wood. And so what I wish I knew when I started barbecuing is the following. And you can use this literally for the duration of your barbecue career. And that is the lighter the, the wood feels, the faster the peak, and the hotter it is on its way to the peak. Once it hits the peak, it's going down. On the descend, the log turns into coals. And so when you're working fires, the game that you're playing is how heavy or how light does this piece of wood feel and how hot and how fast will I reach my peak? The reason that's important because, especially on the bigger smokers, but it's relevant to the backyards as well, we wanna be able to guess when that log is going to hit its peak. And ideally what we're gonna do is we're gonna slide another log in front of this log as it's on the decline. Again, it might not make sense now, I'll show you exactly what I'm talking about here in a second. But the whole idea behind using wood for fuel is that wood produces smoke, smoke is flavor. And I love oak, uh, I love all woods, but I love oak because there is a certain sweet note to oak. When the sugars break down and, they're, and they hit the meat, something special happens where it just produces a bite of barbecue that's just unparalleled. And again, it doesn't just have to be oak. So that's the first thing with wood, is you wanna know, you wanna learn at an expert level, when is this piece of wood gonna peak and when is it gonna descend? And then that's going to dictate how you're running your fire. As you're out shopping for wood, you gotta be able to delineate between a couple things. Naturally dried, naturally seasoned wood, which is what I have here, and then kiln dried wood. I, I won't talk a lot about this, just know that when you're going to the store, if you're going to an academy or you're going to Ace Hardware, they're not gonna have naturally hard dried seasoned wood, they're gonna have kiln dried wood. It's, it's okay to use uh, kiln dried wood, just know that that peak and that descend is gonna happen a lot faster than a naturally seasoned piece of wood. So again, it's okay to use that wood if that's all you have. You're not gonna ruin your barbecue. Just know you're gonna be feeding your fire almost constantly in an effort to keep temps consistent. The alternative to that would be using a seasoned piece of wood coming from um, just nature, naturally seasoned. Just know the following. You're most likely gonna to have to cut this down. You cannot, and I repeat, you cannot use a piece of wood this big in a backyard smoker. So if you can get a hold of some naturally seasoned wood, just make pre preparations to cut the wood down. Now you don't need some fancy saw equipment. Something I've done for years is I have used, and I prefer longer, thinner pieces of wood, meaning I will get a hold of some naturally seasoned wood it com it'll come to me like this if I'm cooking on my backyard smoker. But what I'll do is I'll take my ax, nothing fancy. I'll take my ax and I'll just cut off a little sliver and I'll probably turn this one piece of wood 
into five or six different splits. They're longer, of course, and you can, you can cut those in half, but ideally what you wanna do is you wanna get a thinner piece of wood in your backyard smoker. That way, you're, um, you're able to control your temperatures better. If you dump this puppy on there, you're gonna have a massive, massive spike in temperatures, and it's just gonna be brutal. So keep that in mind. You gotta use the proper wood to scale to your smoker to keep temperatures consistent and to manage your fire accordingly. Now it's time to jump into what makes a pit master a pit master, and that's operating a fire. As you know, we built a fire log cabin style. We let this burn down for about 30 minutes. Right now on the gauge, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven-ish, seven or eight logs on there in total. That gauge, I just checked it, it's 265 degrees. That is cooking temperature. So ideally, I could put meat on there right now, or I could have put meat on there before I started the fire and then let the smoker come to temps with the meat on there. Either way you skin the cat, it's time right now to start to slowly establish our coal bed and I wanna show you exactly how I do that. So there's a few things happening here. Our fire fell vertically almost perfectly and so what typically happens is as a fire burns, logs start to get closer together and so we wanna make sure that we space logs out just right so we're getting the, the right amount of BTU heat the right amount of smoke flavor and the right amount of combustion, which is our coal bed. Those are kind of the three things we're working with. So it, it might be a little hard to see on the camera, but this little guy back here, if I break that down, that turns into a coal. So what I'm gonna do, and it's gonna get a little smoky folks, and that's okay. What I'm gonna do is start to identify logs that I've gotten enough combustion and smoke out of and I can turn into coals. So I'm just gonna start poking my fire. And what's happening is, is I'm finding coals and if you could feel this, it's actively getting hotter and that's good. So I'm just in here breaking down. There's a little guy right here I could catch. See that guy there, right here. I'm gonna break him down. I'm gonna shove him down in the fire. That's the name of the game when you're establishing your coal bed. You're constantly playing a game of identifying logs that you can break down and then repositioning the fire bed. I'll show you in a little bit what it looks like to reposition once you've broken down all your coals, but I just wanted you guys to get an idea of that first initial coal bed, which is what we just built. That's the most important coal bed of it all. And then we'll reposition our logs on top. And then what I'm gonna talk about from there is how are we repositioning our logs to get maximum flavor while also controlling our heat. There's a science to it. You can build fires too big and it'll get away from you in your cook chamber. And so I'm gonna teach you the art that is positioning logs in a way where we can control our fires from the firebox. Now let's talk repositioning. I still got some whole splits that have not run their full life cycle. So what I'm doing, and you don't do this every time, you don't move all the logs out of, out of the way every time. I'm moving all the whole splits out of the way. I have four in total. So these are all up and out of the way. I'm gonna use those in a second. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna find um, remaining chunks of split that have not broken down yet like this guy. And I'm going to break it down and drive it into the fire. Now that's a coal bed. Now what I'm gonna do is link and log this the same way we set it up. You're constantly playing a game of that. Look how it's just on fire. And I'm driving it into the coals. That is literally on the bottom of the firebox. Scoot that guy to the left. Same methodology, my friends. Driving into the coals. Take this guy, set him on top. Take this guy, set him on top. He's almost dead, he's almost done. He's almost ready to go into coals, but we won't use it yet. We won't do it yet. So what I'm doing here, last point, and it's really important. What I'm doing here is I am building 
my bottom layer. It looks really, com not even complex isn't the right word. It looks, uh, it looks like there's a lot happening, but I'm gonna show you how to put this fire under control. You do not want to cook with the fire like this. This is too hot, the flames are too all over the place, and now it's time to get it all under control. So, what have I done? I've made my initial coal bed. I've dug all the splits that still have some life left in them but aren't ready to coal out yet. I've dug them into the coals. I've created my, my height. I got my one log back there. And now what I'm gonna do is throw some splits on and I'm, start, I'm gonna start to link and log it in an effort, in an effort to build a fire that's cookable. Be right back, getting some wood. Once you get to this part in your fire management process, you're almost smooth sailing. The biggest thing that we need to do right now to make this fire uh, the most optimal, the most efficient, is we need to get those flames under control. You do not wanna cook with crazy flames. I know, I know. We're pyromaniacs, we love big flames, but when it comes to barbecue, that is uh, the complete opposite of what you wanna do. So the way that we get this fire under control is we put two extremely flat and dense. These are really heavy, dense logs, and they're very flat, see? We put them on top of the fire vertically, like this, and we put them together. <laughs> we, we literally marry them together. What that's gonna do is that's gonna shoot 95% of the flames out to the side. It's gonna suppress the airflow over the top of the coal bed, which means our fire is gonna slow down, and the density or the moisture content inside of the logs is going to slow down the actual heat production of our fire. It's gonna mask the heat, because we're literally setting dense wood on top of the coal bed, and so it's gonna suppress, and it's gonna start to put that fire under control. I can show you better than I can tell you, so check it out. We got that guy there. We got this nice barky piece going right next to him. What we've done is we have literally covered up the entire top portion of our fire. What I'm gonna do is smack the living snot out of the top of this to push it down into the coal bed like so. We're gonna get these as close as we can together. We're gonna let that burn. As those two logs start to burn, remember I talked about elite level fire management is being able to guess when your log is going to peak and then descend. As this log starts to peak, otherwise known as heat up. It's gonna to start to uh, combust, and the two logs are gonna to start to separate from each other. As they separate, that gap in the middle is gonna uh, cause more oxygen, more flow, and as more oxygen starts to get between the two logs, they're going to continue to heat up and continue to cook. And so that's how we build that organic fire. We push our logs together, we build good coal beds, we push down logs on top of the coal beds to control the flames, and then we let the fire tell us how it wants to run, and then we just kind of keep it in control. So I'm gonna, let this, uh, I'm gonna let this fire burn. If I had 12 briskets on the pit, they would be smoking beautifully right now. The coals are giving us enough heat. The logs are giving us enough smoke. If you were in the shack right now, in our smoke shack, it smells like barbecue heaven in here. This is. It's nostalgic, it's beautiful. Guys, we do the, the purest form of cooking, which is live fire cooking, and you can't beat it. So let's close this down, let's let this burn, and I'll show you what the temps are doing here in a little bit. In my backyard, guys, my backyard, guys, if you're like, hey, what about us? We'll go check out the backyard pit. We'll talk about that. There's a million videos on YouTube telling you how to run a backyard pit. Again, in an effort not to be an echo chamber, I wanna talk about or fill the void with the information that I don't really see on YouTube. And so, uh, so far, I've shown you how I start a fire in a backyard smoker. What I really don't see on YouTube is, well, what the heck do I do or how do I troubleshoot my fire if it's not working? If it gets overly smoky, if my temps are going too high or too low, how do I troubleshoot my backyard smoker? I can tell you, these are far harder to run and operate than the 500 gallons, but let me promise you this. I'll make this promise to you. If you can learn how to operate 
a backyard smoker. I'm telling you, you will be an amazing pit master when you jump to a 250 and up. So right now I have a dirty fire. Uh, temperature's 200, the thing's smoky, it's not operating right. What do you do? First thing you do, pop the top door if you have a top door. If you don't have a top door but you got a big firebox uh, door, open the firebox door, open everything up. What you might even do is open the actual door. The reason why you do this is you want to start to give the fire oxygen. What could have happened is you put a log on that was too big, it was too heavy, it was too moist. Maybe your coal bed wasn't established, right? I mean, a, a million things could go wrong. It doesn't matter what caused the problem. What matters is the problem exists and we need to fix it. So let's talk about what it is we want to do. In most cases, the only thing you need to do is get enough oxygen underneath the log. The first thing you can do is potentially introduce a really small, really thin piece of wood. Most times by introducing a really small, really thin piece of wood, it's going to allow um, the fire to catch and combust the bigger logs properly. So that's an option. A second option is you can move the logs around and open up your coal bed to create more heat and then stack more logs on top like this. See, I just put them parallel to each other and you can do one or one of two things. You can put one bigger log on top. That's going to give you a ton of heat, a ton of BTUs, a ton of combustion, assuming you have the proper oxygen, or you can throw a smaller log on top. That's going to give you again, remember peaks and valleys. That's going to give you an incredibly quick peak, but you got to be prepared to follow a log behind it because it's going to descend really quickly. In this case, I'm just going to throw this big log right on top, like so. That's going to catch. It's catching almost instantly. I'm going to close my cook, my cook chamber door down. Remember, smokestack always open. I'm going to leave this top door open just for a couple minutes. I just want to monitor that log. I want to make sure it's not lying to me. Sometimes you put a log on and it catches super quick, but that's because you have every door to the entire smoker open, which means it's just extreme oxygen. But when you close it down, it automatically snuffs itself out. So you just want to make sure you leave this door open just long enough to make sure that it's not being deceiving. Let me in, let me in with this point. If you have food on, let's say you're an hour into your cook, you're 30 minutes into your cook, you're six hours into your cook, it, it really doesn't matter where. But let's say you have food on, you have meat on, and you're thinking, man, I'm really worried. If I put a log on, my gauge is gonna jump, I got this big fire, am I hurting my meat, am I overcooking my meat? Do not worry. This gauge is hypersensitive. Trust the smoker, trust that that log is going to burn itself down in due time, don't worry. Close the door down, pump some really clean smoke, and trust the process. Welcome to barbecue, folks. It's not easy, it's not consistent, it's not predictable, but it's a blast. Um, let me add this to you real quick. This is why on these backyard big box store smokers, you cannot play a bunch of games with the dampers and the firebox door and all this stuff. You can't do it. You got enough to worry about. This smokestack, this is the reality, and it's not wrong, guys. I've cooked on this, I've cooked on this smoker this type of backyard smoker for over a decade and I've turned out some damn good barbecue. So it's okay, but the reality is this smoker is not optimized for maximum airflow. It's not optimized for maximum draw and that's okay. You just got to work with it. So leave the firebox door open, throw a log on top, give it some oxygen. It'll catch. You'll be okay. I told you guys I wasn't going to make this necessarily a how, how to barbecue video. I do want to note, uh, on this point because it is important. So in the course of a cook, let's say you're cooking brisket, especially on a 500, 250, 500, 1,000 gallon. If you want to turn out an elite level brisket, then you're going to want to slowly climb temperatures and you're gonna finish a brisket as a general rule of thumb. You're gonna finish a batch of briskets at a higher temperature than you started them. So I wanna take some time to explain how exactly do you climb the temperatures in a 500 gallon smoker? It is not as simple as open up the fire, firebox door, 
throw a couple logs in and walk away. There are some uh, best practices, so let me talk on that real quick. Right here, um, our fire is burned down. We have the two top logs. They're burning decently okay. This fire is a 250 degree fire. We have two big dense logs on top. And we have a massive coal bed underneath. It's pumping out about 250 degrees worth of heat. I want to, let's say in theory, I had some briskets on. Let's say it's been an hour and a half. My briskets have been in there. I've been setting my bark, letting them slowly acclimate. And now I'm gonna start to really bump some temps and start to cook them. I'd wanna bump the temp up to about 275. So here's the uh, approach that I follow in doing so. The first thing, airflow. The first rule you wanna follow in raising temperatures is creating airflow. The easiest way to do that is just to create some separation in the logs that are in there. It looks like this. I have my two top logs, coal bed. I'm simply just going to scoot this log over. I'll put that on the far right. I'll open this log up, far left, and it is raging hot. I'm gonna spread my coal bed out, like so. And I'm gonna put these back on top. I'm gonna drive them into the coals just a little bit. I want those flat. I want them even across so that they can receive the next logs. I've created some separation. There's a, a couple inches worth of space in the middle. I'm gonna put anywhere from two to three logs on top of that base layer. And um, it's really important that you get your logs right. This is what I call a flat to triangle. It's flat on the bottom and it comes to a point. I love this log when climbing temperatures. I really love this log all the time, but I love this log in climbing temperatures. Let me explain what this log's gonna do. I really hope you guys are enjoying this content. If you're enjoying the content, please like, comment, subscribe, show some support. I love, I love, love, love this kind of log. And again, I'm talking to my barbecue purists. I'm talking to the guys who wanna get elite. If you're, if you're in this video with me right now, it's freaking 100 degrees in the smoke shack. My wife's behind the camera sweating her ass off. I'm sweating my ass off. This is important data, so I hope I'm talking to the purists right here. This is what separates the average from the phenomenal. This log is gonna go in front, and I'm gonna feed it towards the front of the fire. It's gonna do a couple things. This lip, it's slanted down, it's flat on the bottom. This slant, this lip, is gonna make sure that my flames are gonna come flat towards the front of the fire and, they're, and it's gonna kick it up. That's what's gonna happen, because remember, I have a smokestack that's drawing extreme amounts of air from the firebox. And so as it's drawing, this angle is gonna make sure that the flames come out and up. That's what I want. I don't want flames going into my cook chamber, I want flames coming up. So that's why I use this little lip. I'm gonna follow this with an identical log facing the other side. Gosh, I love barbecue. I'm gonna put the two backs together and I'm gonna put a half an inch in between, just enough airflow. I'm not gonna to touch them, I'm not gonna kiss them, just a little bit. And the reason why, I point the first lip forward, I point the other lip back and it's gonna do the exact same thing. That front log is gonna shoot the flames out and up. In the, the back log, cause I got my slant and my lip down, it's gonna shoot the flames back and up. And so what I'm gonna create is a fire that burns like this. It's curved. I don't know if that's coming through on the camera, but you'll see, check it out. Got my first one in there. Remember, flat to triangle, and I'm gonna send that puppy longest side pointing to the back, like so. Once it gets just a little oxygen, it's gonna start to do its thing, and it's magnificent. Just wait, guys. Here it comes. It's starting to catch. 
you notice, you notice guys how the, the flame is literally coming out and it's bending over the top of the slant. That's because our smokestack is drawing the heat. And so that flame has to fight its way back uphill. So it's coming directly out and it's curling right up. The front log's doing the same thing. If you can see that front flame, all the flames are shooting vertically up rather than into the cook chamber. And that's because we picked the right splits at the right time. You go flat bottom to triangle and you let it burn nice, low, slow, vertical fire. You do not want a high fire. You do not want a crazy flame fire. You want them to be tamed and soft. We got those two logs on. I just explained the methodology behind those two logs. We have to put two more. A coal bed plus four whole logs gives me about 275 degrees. And so um, it's important that I walk you guys through the, two, the four logs that I'm using. So the first two logs were really wide, really sharp ends. Remember, flat bottom up to a triangle. We're gonna get two more logs that are kind of like that, but here's where they, here's where they are a little bit different. The back edge of the next two logs are gonna be shorter and thicker in nature. The bottom's gonna be flat and the top's gonna be flat. Ideally, I like the top to have bark. The bark gives, I think, just, just a little bit more smokiness while we're building our bark. And so the, the bottom's flat, the top's flat, and then we have the one, the one raised edge. And I'm gonna try to find a log that's similar in nature, top's flat, bottom's flat, and then we have our, our, our uh, square back. And we're gonna put them together like this on the top. And, and they're gonna go right over the top like this. And what's gonna happen with that fire is remember, we put the first batch in like so, and it's gonna shoot flames out of the back and up, out of the top and up, and then we're gonna put the logs on like this, and this is gonna shoot the flames out of the sides and up, and out of the other side and up, all while simultaneously stopping all of the flames from coming up through the middle of the logs. So the only escape route that we've created for these logs are out of the sides, and because they slant down in all directions, it's gonna suppress the fire and keep all of the flames gentle in nature. Once again, I can show you better than I can tell you. That, my friends, is how I build my fires. All right, backyard guys, let's round out the topic that is operating a backyard smoker with a few points in summary. So first, this is not, this, this model of smoker, it's not predictable, it is not consistent, and that's the beauty of cooking on it. Okay, so that's first. Second, if you start your fire with lump charcoal, you'll get a, a faster coal bed, and that makes for burning the logs uh, more efficiently and better. If you start with briquette charcoal, briquette is not as, ho as hot as lump, so what's gonna happen is once those briquettes uh, bur burn down, they're gonna create a lot of ash. So it, it requires more maintenance if you start a fire with briquettes. If you start with briquettes, be prepared to scoop out some of that ash to get it out of the way so you can create more airflow. Another point is it is completely okay to cook a brisket if you're a beginner on a backyard size smoker for six hours. Set the brisket bark for four to six hours, wrap it in butcher paper and finish it in the oven. That is okay. As you're learning these backyard smokers, you do not need to come out of the gate cooking brisket for 15 hours. It is okay to set a bark for the first six hours, put it in butcher paper and shove it in the oven. So if you're doing that, you can run a pretty consistent fire for about six hours. If you want to go the long haul, that's where it gets a little difficult and that's where this next point is really important. The firebox is so small compared to say a 500 gallon, there's gonna be so much ash buildup, it's gonna get really crowded 
It, it's difficult to, to clean it for six hours. You just kind of got to let it burn. At about the six hour mark, a little, a little trick that I do is I get a, uh, I don't have one, but envision a big tin bowl or something that you can transfer hot coals into at about the four to six hour mark. Right when you're like, man, my fire's unwieldy. I can't seem to get my cold bed going. Nothing's working. Take all the coals out, all the wood out, put it in that tin bucket of sorts, set that to the side, simultaneously start a new chimney of lump charcoal, get new splits, and just dump the, the coals right back into the firebox, and you're rolling like you never stopped. I've used that trick for many years, and I like to do that, especially if nothing is working at all. I just can't get it figured out. Just start over, guys. Your brisket's been going for six hours. Take all the coals out, take all the wood out, put a new chimney full of lump and get it going again. It's a really good tip. Lastly, I'll say this. What's the overall goal that we're looking for in a backyard smoker when operating a fire? The overall goal is to build a decent coal bed and have properly sized splits go on top to provide the smoke. That's the goal. Right now my gauge is telling me that I'm cooking right at about 300 degrees. Between you and I, I've cooked many of briskets at 300 degrees in this smoker and it's perfectly fine. 250 to 300, trust me, you'll be okay. Let me show you what a fire looks like at 300 degrees and we'll go from there. It's simple guys, it's nothing crazy. I got two side splits, decently sized, and I got one little guy on top. That'll give me 300 degrees for another at least 20 minutes and then it'll start to burn down. What I use to operate these, these small fires is I have a really tiny shovel, or what I do is I just use tongs, and if I don't have tongs, I just move it around with a piece of wood. To readjust my fire, I just poke at it to create my coal bed. Spread my coals out. Set that back on top. Throw another log on. That's for demonstration purposes, my friends. It's a little larger than I like. However, I have used logs that big before in this smoker and it's okay, it's okay. That size log, if I use that, what I'd be doing is wanting to get some rest. So, throw that big log on. My fire's 300 degrees right now. That big log will literally jump my temperature to about 450 degrees and I won't freak out. It'll hang out at 450 for just a little bit and then it'll slowly start to decline and it'll settle right back at about 300 to 275. And it can roll like that in this smoker for at least 30 minutes, maybe 45 minutes before I have to mess with it again. So I'll throw that log on, I'll shut this down, keep my firebox door open and uh, I'll get some sleep. I'll rest for a little bit, I'll come back and I'll rinse and repeat. That's the name of the game with these backyard guys. There's no, there's no specific recipe. You just kind of got to feel it out poke at the fire, create your, your coal bed, throw a log on and monitor it. And that's the process. After running this fire in reality, not in the edited version, reality for about three and a half hours or so, I wanna finally show you what it looks like to achieve, in my opinion, what the perfect, most efficient fire looks like. It's burning in here right now. Before I open the door, um, I want to explain something. When I pop this door, it's gonna shove in an extreme amount of oxygen. So make sure you're paying attention because once the oxygen goes, the fire's gonna go crazy. But the first about five seconds of what's happening in here, in my opinion, is the perfect fire. If you can get a fire to look like this, trust me, it's gonna be barbecue perfection. The flames aren't too crazy. They're not going into the cook chamber. That is a perfect fire. That's a 280 degree fire right where I want it. And it's just burning very, very gently. That fire, because I know my smoker like the back of my hand, is gonna last me at least an hour at, at 280, perfectly at an hour. The real secret to turning out incredible barbecue is getting really clean, good, healthy smoke, hitting your meat through the duration of the cook. It doesn't have to be clean the entire time. It's okay if temperatures go up, it's okay if temperatures go down, but the ultimate goal on your journey to becoming an elite level pit master is understanding how to remove as many variables, as many single point of failures as possible, 
to reduce, to shrink the mistake gap. When you can shrink that gap, you can turn out incredible, consistent barbecue. Lastly, my friends, let me pull on your heartstring just a little bit. I know you're ready to swipe up. I know you're ready to double click and speed through this. It's really important to me that you guys, um, if you like this video, if you appreciate the content, if it helps you at all, it's really important that you guys subscribe, drop a comment. My wife and I, I'll just be frank with you, we work extremely hard. It's like 11 o'clock right now. We have work uh, really early in the morning and we're out here busting our butts to provide some really helpful content to the barbecue community because we love you guys. So if this content helped you, it would mean the world to me for you to show that you got value out of this by dropping a comment, a like, or most of all, subscribing. I love you guys. You guys are the best in the barbecue community. And as always, meet and greet over and out.